I hope you're all safe and secure in your respective homes. Thank you for joining us in this broadcast where we study God's Word online in the midst of this pandemic. We're praying that soon we will all be able to go back to our respective Sunday worship services. We hope also that our messages will help you with your walk with God, your worship of God, and your work for God. Well, today, friends, we are starting a series entitled Experiencing God's Faithfulness. We are looking at God's faithfulness when we go through trials or what the Bible calls the testing of our faith. As we read here in James chapter 1, verse 3, which says, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Friends, no one is exempted or immune from these trials that God uses to purify our faith. Unfortunately, though, it's when we are going through some testing, that's when we begin to doubt God's faithfulness to help us pass the test. But friends, nothing can be farther from the truth. Remember that God would test us to build us up and not to tear us down, to purify us and not to destroy us. As we read here in Psalm 66 verse 10, For you, God, tested us, you refined us like silver. The Apostle Peter testifies here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Also, we read that God will test us so we can know ourselves better and then better ourselves from what we know as we make those necessary corrections. As the psalmist prayed here in Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Also, the writer of Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3 says, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. That's why we read in our Bible story after story of how God tested His people so their life story can be a great lesson for all of us. Now, each one of us may have our own favorite Bible character. By the way, who is your favorite Bible character? man of God or woman of God, come on, you may type it in, someone whose life story has been of great help to you in one point in your life. You know, when I was still working in my profession as a civil engineer, my favorite character was Nehemiah, the building contractor who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. But now when I became a pastor, my favorite character is Malachi because he said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. But now seriously, when we think of a list of biblical characters who belong among God's greatest, Abraham would certainly be included. I mean, he towers among many as a man who was, who was called the friend of God. Wow, that's quite a title, isn't it? How would you like to be called a friend of God? But then we all know that as a friend of God, Abraham was severely tested by God. And so in this study, what we'd like to learn is how he passed the test. Our message title, Experiencing God's Faithfulness in Times of Testing. And our message text is found in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 18. This is a familiar story to most of us, if not all of us. Okay, if you have your Bible with you, please turn now to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 18. Let's commit this time in prayer, shall we? Our Father and our God, we are just so thankful for the privilege that we can come together to study your word. And Lord, we pray that there won't be any distractions. We pray that our minds would be alert, our spirits sensitive to your spirit, so that we will not miss anything you want us to learn and change in the way we live today. And so we commit to you this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, here in Genesis 22 is the story of a man who is well over 100 years old already. He is old enough to be a great, great grandfather. But here we could say that he's just a recent parent. Miraculous as it seemed and as it was. 
But now, one thing we need to remember here is that before Abraham became a father, God gave him a promise that he will have a son and that through this son, a nation will be born. But now, from the time the promise was given up to the time when it was fulfilled, Abraham waited for more than 20 years. More than 20 years. Wow, that's a long time to wait to have a son. Plus the fact that Abraham and Sarah were getting well advanced in years. In fact, Sarah was barren and now in her menopausal years already. But then God miraculously fulfilled His promise and Sarah conceived at 90 years of age. Abraham was 100 years old when his son was born and he named him Isaac, which means laughter. And Isaac became the joy of Abraham's life the center of his affection, his lifeline into the future, Isaac became the meaning of his existence. And just as we are all prone to do, whatever or whoever gives us much joy and satisfaction and fulfillment, we all tend to place that personal thing on the throne of our inner life. It could be our job or ministry, our friends or a certain activity, a certain possession or hobby, or it could be a loved one as in the case here of Abraham. So severe and so obvious to God was this adoration that the Lord moved in on Abraham's life to put Isaac in proper perspective. Okay, so verse 1 opens up with the words, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, the word tested here in the original conveys passion or intensity. So this verse could be rendered, God severely tested Abraham or God passionately tested Abraham. So when it says here in verse 1, sometime later God tested Abraham, what it is communicating with us is that Abraham has experienced many tests in his life before Genesis chapter 22, but none of them could compare to what he's about to experience. So what's the test all about? Let's continue reading verse 2. It says, then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you loved, and go to the region of Moriah, and then the words, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Friends, God's command is clear. This is indeed going to be Abraham's greatest test. Will he do what God asks, or will he ignore him as though he has never spoken? You know, there are several qualities we can study in the life of Abraham, but the one I believe we can all learn a lot from is about obedience. You know, obedience is such an unpopular word, isn't it? Many think it's a killjoy. I mean, just the mere mention of the word conjures up images of a burdensome, a difficult, or often an unhappy life. But I can assure you this is a misconception. Our God is not some kind of a cosmic killjoy. No, we can be confident that our God has our ultimate happiness in mind when He asks us to obey. So here in this passage, we'll discover from Abraham's experience the principles on how to pass the test God brings into our lives. His whole life actually is a lesson on obedience. But this one particular episode in Abraham's life is what we could call the climax of his life of obedience. Well, the first thing we see here is that passing the test requires our complete obedience. You know, the thing about obedience is that it is not optional. But some Christians are willing to obey God as long as it doesn't entail too much sacrifice. I, I mean, their commitment to God will, will, uh, is only up to the level where their comfort is maintained. If doing God's will means sweat, blood, and tears, don't count them in. But God's command here to Abraham shows at least three dimensions of obedience. First of all, God said, take your son. You know, it would have been different if God said, take your best lamb, or even take your whole or entire flat, or even if God said, take your mother-in-law. I mean, the struggle might be lesser for some people. But the Lord clearly said, take your son. God had targeted in on the son who had become first in Abraham's life. You see, there is nothing cheap in what God asks. The worth of a son cannot be measured. You value your son more than your life, isn't it? Take your son tells us 
First of all, it is a worthy obedience. I mean, think of the worth of a son. We've heard of fathers who prayed when their son is very sick, who said, Lord, take my life instead, but please let my son live. Those of us who are fathers here would be willing to give up our own lives for a son. That's how costly disobedience is. You know, this reminds me of what David said to a guy named Arauna who owned a piece of land which David, who was the king at that time, wanted to buy. Arauna would like to just give the land to the king for free. But notice what David said here in 1 Chronicles 21 verse 24. No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, and then look at his words, or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. Oh, wow, I won't offer to God something that costs me nothing. Friends, if I ask you, is living the Christian life costing you something? Or is your Christian life an easygoing Sunday picnic cheap thing? How is your Christian life costing you in terms of your comfort, your finances, your time, your gasoline? You know, this reminds me of the lyrics of a song by Keith Green, based on 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. It says, To obey is better than sacrifice. I don't need your money. I want your life. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want more than Sundays and Wednesday nights. And then it says, Because if you can come to me every day, then don't bother coming at all. Hard words. But nothing compared to take your son. God requires a worthy obedience. And then God said, your only son, Isaac. Again, things would have been different if Abraham had 12 sons. I'm sure it's still not easy, but at least you have 11 more sons. But interesting, we did not hear Abraham complain to God, Lord, this is my only son. You know, that tells us that our submission to God should not only be a worthy obedience, but also it should be a willing obedience obedience. Take your son, your only son, and then God added these words, whom you love. The test came when Abraham's heart was already affectionately intertwined with his son. Friends, that tells us that obedience should not only be a worthy obedience, a willing obedience, but also a wholehearted obedience. And what is it that Abraham is supposed to do with his son, his only son whom he loved? Verse 2 continues by saying, Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Sacrifice him. Put him on the altar. So God was not, uh, was not just asking here for a verbal affirmation. It was not enough for Abraham to just say to God, Okay, Lord, now I confess my sin of putting Isaac on the pedestal of my life. I would now recommit my life and make you number one. Let's just forget about this business of sacrificing my son, okay? But no, friends, God was not asking for a verbal affirmation. He wants a practical demonstration. Okay, Abram, prove that I'm number one. Friends, words cannot express the deep anguish Abram must have felt when he heard God's command, especially with the phrase burnt offering. The Hebrew word used here means a whole burnt offering. Again, it could have been different if God was just asking for an arm of Isaac or a leg of Isaac. But no, it's got to be a whole burnt offering. Isaac, who has become Abraham's hope of a new release on life, his bright hope for the future. And God says, take him to the altar. Would he be willing to entrust all of that to God? His welfare, his future, his life. The second point we see here is that passing the test reveals our absolute trust. God called for Isaac's very life as a whole burnt offering. That means, friends, it's all or nothing. Abraham's faith and obedience were now on the line. God has commanded that he make a tremendous sacrifice. What would he do? What would you have done in such a situation? Would you obey? The following verses preserve for us what Abraham did in response to this demanding test, which would show us at least three more wonderful things about his obedience. Verse 3 says, 
Early next morning, Abram got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. The first thing we notice here is the phrase, early next morning. Now, that's what you call an immediate obedience. When he heard God's command, he obeyed him immediately. We don't read here a hint of hesitation. There was no plea bargaining or arguing or doubting or rationalizing. He heard the instruction and then he obeyed. Somebody said, delayed obedience is disobedience. And then verse 5 says, He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. And then notice these words, we will worship and then we will come back. Wow, first person plural. We will worship, we will come back. Well, I thought Abraham split the wood and loaded the donkey and went on a three-day journey to Mount Moriah, realizing that he's going to put the boy on the altar as a whole burnt offering. But he says, we will come back. How could he say that? Well, friends, we don't have to speculate. The Holy Spirit revealed to us what exactly was in Abraham's mind. Put a finger to Genesis chapter 22 and now turn to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we find the answer here. Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith, the chapter that talks about practical obedience. Now, a big chunk of this chapter is about Abraham's obedience. That's in verse 8 up to verse 19. Now, look particularly at verse 17, Hebrews 11, 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered, uh, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Now, note why Abraham could say to those men, we will return. Verse 19, it says here, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. So that's how he could say, I and the boy will go. We will worship God by offering my son on the altar. And when my son is burned up, God will raise my son from the dead and we will come back to you. Let's go, Isaac. So not only was it an immediate obedience, friends, it was an intelligent obedience. Verse 19 says, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. That means he had enough faith to believe that since God promised him a son, and now God is asking him to sacrifice that son, then God must raise his son from the dead to fulfill his promise. Friends, that's not dumb faith. That's intelligent faith. In fact, somebody defined faith this way. Faith is seeing the invisible, knowing the unknowable, believing the incredible, so that we achieve the impossible. You see, some people think that faith is just a leap in the dark. No. Faith is confident believing that God could do the impossible. Abraham believed that God could do the unbelievable, the incredible, that when he would put the knife on the throat of his son Isaac and let the blood flow, and when the flames would have consumed his son, somehow, in the miracle of God's plan, God will bring him back to life. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I'm confident God will do it, and so I will obey. Intelligent obedience, we will come back. Now, verses 6 to 8 contain some of the most touching words in all of the Bible. Look at verse 6. It says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. You see, Isaac was no longer a little boy here. He was strong enough to carry wood up going up that mountain. And so it says here, and he himself carried the fire and the knife and as the two of them went together. This is a very tender scene of a father and son walking side by side. Abraham knows what is coming. Isaac, however, doesn't. And he innocently inquires here in verse 7. Isaac spoke, spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Good question, Isaac. How do you break the news? Well, Abraham's answer in verse 8 is even better. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. What he is saying 
is this. I don't know exactly how it is going to work out, my son, but I'm going to tell you right now, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord himself will provide. Abraham just added a new name of God to the many names already revealed from Genesis 1 to 21. Jehovah Jireh. It's such a reassuring name, isn't it? Yes, we can be confident when we obey because we know that God will provide. He will provide the strength. He will provide the grace. He will provide the faith. Jehovah Jireh. That's a great name of God, isn't it? A name that we can all teach our children. Somehow as we wrestle through life and we face uh, with tough questions, our kids would ask us, what are we going to do now, Dad? I don't know, son. But I can tell you one thing. God is faithful. He is Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. I don't know what will happen now that I've lost my job. I don't know what will happen now that your mom is gone. I don't know what will happen now that our business has gone down. I don't know what will happen now that we've lost our house in the fire. I don't know what will happen now that we've run out of money. I do not know, son. But here's what I'm sure of. God is good. His will is perfect. He knows what is best. The Lord will provide. Listen to this, friends. What God wants is that we place everything on the altar. Anything or anyone that is not on the altar can be taken away from us. Why? Friends, because of these words, for the things that we hold on too tightly are the very things that can tie us down. These are the very things that can keep us from obeying God. As someone also said these words, there can be no doubt that this possessive clinging to things is one of the most harmful habits in life because it is so natural, it is rarely recognized for the evil that it is. We are often hindered to give up treasures to the Lord out of fear for their safety. This is especially true when it comes to our loved ones. But brothers and sisters, nothing is safe that is not committed to the Lord. There is no safer place in all the world where you can place your treasures than in the heart of God. Anything that is not placed on the altar is in danger of being lost forever. Now, not only was it an immediate obedience, an intelligent obedience, but also we see here that it's an intentional obedience. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says here, when they reached the place God had told him about, now notice here the intentional, the methodical obedience of Abraham. Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it, he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then verse 10 says, then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. It was such an intentional obedience. So somewhere between Abraham's answer and the binding of his son, Abraham told Isaac, you are the sacrifice, my son. Now in dealing with this moving scene, we must not forget the obedience of Isaac. Remember, if he's big enough to carry wood going up a mountain, he's big enough to seize the knife and resist his centenarian father. But as a true type of Jesus Christ, he opened up his mouth and lay down willingly upon the altar. You know, one Jewish tradition tells us that Isaac was already in his early 30s when this happened. If that's the case, then this is a perfect picture of Christ who was sacrificed at the age of 33. And so, when it says there, when they reached the place God had told him about, which is Mount Moriah, now if you trace Mount Moriah geographically and chronologically, some scholars believe you will see that by the first century, it was the same mount that Christ was offered. That means Mount Moriah is the same place of the crucifixion. It's the same place as Mount Calvary. And this, all of this to tell us, friends, that the perfect sacrifice is yet to come. And now from verses 11 to 18, we finally see here the third and last point, passing the test results in our ultimate happiness. And the first thing we see here is that Abraham was restrained. Abraham was restrained. And so if we can now picture in our minds what's happening here, you know, uh, like a movie, you can now see Isaac bound and placed on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham already placed a welfare case on his forehead and then holding the knife in his hand, 
look off into the distance in a moment of hesitation, and then the knife flashed in the sunlight as he lifted it high, ready to jump it down into the throat of his son and cut away like you would a sacrificial lamb. But then out of the clear blue sky, as, he, as his son gripping that knife was now on its way down, the angel of the Lord called out, Abraham, Abraham! And he stopped in midair, and you can almost hear the, he, the, his sigh of relief. Now watch what God says here in verse 12. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. And then look at these words. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What a statement for God to say. Now I know. I thought he knew everything. Well, he does. But practically speaking, he's say, saying, Abraham, you have just demonstrated to me that I am first in your life. Put the knife away for now I know. Remember? God was not asking for a verbal affirmation from Abraham, but a practical demonstration. You know, words are cheap, isn't it? Many times, we, what we say is not backed up by what we do. Brothers and sisters, you and I will never know how much we love God until we obey. Well, how about us? Can we hear God say those words about us? Now I know that you fear God. Friends, if there's no one else with you in that room as you listen to this broadcast, except you and God alone, will you hear God say to you, you were willing to put that sinful habit away? Now I know that you fear God. You were willing to put that nicotine and alcohol addiction, your gambling and pornography? Now I know you fear God. You were willing to forgive and remove that hate in your heart? Now I know that you fear God. You were willing to wait and not take matters into your own hands. Now I know that you fear God. You were willing to trust me for that problem. Now I know that you fear God. You were willing to obey me in spite of the hardships, to suffer for my name's sake. Now I know that you fear God. Brothers and sisters, we need to realize that when God tests us, it's not about helping an, an all-knowing God to know how much we love Him but to help us finite man to know the depth of our devotion and realize how strong our commitment to God is. As F.B. Meyer wrote, he said, Nothing else in the circumference of Abraham's life could have been such a test as anything connected with the heir of promise, the child of his old age, the laughter of his life. So God put him to a supreme test that all men might henceforth know that a mortal man could love God so much as to put him first, though his dearest lay in the opposite scale of the balance of the heart. You see, if not for this account preserved for us to read, we wouldn't know up to what length Abraham was willing to obey God. Friends, you and I would not know how much we love God if not for those trials. We wouldn't know how much we trust God if not for those deprivations. How much we fear God if not for those temptations that we have overcome. When God says, now I know, it's really for us to know the genuineness of our faith and the assurance that it produces in our hearts that we really are the children of God. Friends, we also see here in verse 13 that when we trust and obey God, He provides. Verse 13 says, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Not only Abraham was restrained, but we see here that Isaac was replaced. Isaac replaced. I can just picture in my mind right now Abraham and Isaac embracing each other and worshiping God. Friends, what we release to God, God will replace with something better. And the flip side to that is that what we retain for ourselves is usually what God will ask to release to Him. What we pull aside and put in a corner and preserve for our satisfaction, for our allegiance, that is the thing God says, give that to me. Brothers and sisters, what we need to learn here is that God is to be that place of allegiance. He is to have that priority. Now I can assure you that there are times when we won't understand why God takes away something or someone away. But, I, but as you release it, God replaces it with something better. And in doing so, 
He changes your spirit. You can even explain how that happens, but it's true. It was a mother named Mary Thompson who wrote these words. She said, give up thy sons to bear the message glorious. Give up thy wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out thy soul for them in prayer victorious. And all thou spendest, Jesus will repay. Yes, friends, when God replaces, he also rewards. There's a ram somewhere in the thicket. You know, sometimes we can be so focused on the problem that we miss God's provision. Sometimes we can be so focused on the pain that we fail to see the promise. Instead, friends, as, as we see here, obedience results in our ultimate happiness. Abraham was restrained, Isaac replaced, obedience rewarded. The angel of the Lord said to Abraham in verses 16 and 17, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Friends, does obedience pay? There you have it. When we obey, God multiplies his blessings. Friends, this story we've just studied isn't just ancient history. It's a fresh lesson for all of us. The unwavering example of Abraham encourages us to obey God immediately, intelligently, and intentionally, even when God's commands seem contrary to human reason. I mean, no, no one ever said that obedience is easy. Sure, it's tough. Obedience involves uh, bending our own will to conform to God's will. But what we may be confident of, brothers and sisters, however, is that God, our Father, always has our ultimate happiness in mind when he asks us to obey. I don't know what you're going through these days. I don't know what God is telling you to do today. But whatever it is, just do it. I tell you, it may seem painful now, but we may be confident that anything he may require of us will never compare to what he will also abundantly lavish as, as, as a reward. And in the midst of this incredible test, Abraham's faith in God did not waver. As the Apostle Paul wrote here in Romans chapter 4, 20 and 21, talking about Abraham's faith, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. When he obeyed, God became more real to him. We will go, we will worship, we will return, what he has promised, he will provide. I don't know how, I don't know when, but somehow in the miracle of God's plan, what he takes will be given back in an even better fashion. Yes, friends, when we obey, God provides. Jehovah Jireh. That's a great name of God, isn't it? Yes, brothers and sisters, God rewards obedience. Obedience results in our ultimate happiness. Now, I do not know what burdens you are carrying these days, what testing of your faith you have to face. But remember, friends, there is no burden so heavy that the Lord cannot carry. If you cannot see his hand, you can trust his heart. He is just there beside you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God is faithful when we go through the trials of life. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Brothers and sisters, at least three things we learned here about how to pass the test. Number one, how to pass the test. We see here, passing the test requires our complete obedience. Number two, passing the test reveals our absolute trust. And number three, passing the test results in our ultimate happiness. Now I know that you fear God. What is God speaking to you today? Friends, let's just trust God that He always har, har, has our ultimate happiness in mind. Let's commit this time in prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this story, incredible story. And Lord, we pray whatever tests we are going through these days, Lord, help us to obey you, to trust in you, to never give up. 
And so, Father God, we just commit each one of you, each one of us here, and we, we pray, indeed, each one of us will experience you as our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless everyone. Thank you for watching today's celebration. If you have committed your life to Christ today, we have a special gift for you. Please send us a note by visiting our website at championlife.ca and select contact. You can also send your prayer requests or call us by phone. And remember, you can give your tithes and offering to our website, text to give, use the Champion Life Center app or a transfer. Just make sure to select the location that you are giving to. Please join our Connect Lounge after the celebration. Link can be found on our Facebook page. And lastly, don't forget to follow us on our social media pages. This is the best way to stay updated and engage with our Champion Life community. And we want to stay connected with you. We are so glad that you have joined us and we hope to see you online again next Sunday. God bless you.